Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest Farm Files episode of our Farmer and Rancher Driven Podcast, FP Next, powered by John Deere. I'm one of your co host, Sarah McNaught, and I'm here with Kurt Arns. Hi, Sarah. Yes, we're powered by John Deere. So, for all of your equipment and technology needs, see your local Deere dealer. So, here we are, end of July, into early August. School will be starting soon in a lot of places. Uh, the silage cutters will be rolling out into the country to cut corn silage for some cattle. And we all know what that means. It's almost farm show season for Farm Progress folks. Uh, the farm show crew at Farm Progress is busy all year long planning for the Farm Progress show this year in Boone, Iowa. And of course, Husker Harvest Days at Grand Island, Nebraska. But that isn't all for this crew. They have the New York Farm Show in February in Syracuse, New York. And more recently, the Organic Grower Summit in Monterey, California. Yeah, and Kurt, I have to say, before we start talking farm shows, I just want to thank our listeners for spending time with us over the past 20 episodes. And this episode is a little special, not only because of our guests who we have today, but you can also see us this time. So if you want to watch the video version, if you're listening on a different platform, head on over to YouTube and you can kind of see the inside look of our work from home spaces. But Getting down to our topic today, I know about as soon as one farm show is over, the Farm Progress team is back working on making the next one even better. So we live farm show season almost all year long. And of course, like we visited with Liz Hodges in our last episode, my favorite part of farm shows is getting to work from the same office, you know, for the show. Even if we are spread out across the showgrounds, we're a pretty great team. So it's good to get us all together. Yep. And uh, today we have the pleasure of speaking with Matt Youngman, the Farm Progress National Farm Show Manager. And uh, it's go time for Matt and his crew. So uh, Farm Progress Show creeps up ever closer, just a month now away in Boone. And then two weeks later, it's Husker Harvest Days. I just saw Matt in Grand Island a week or so ago at a safety meeting for HHD. And, and I know uh, he's a little busy these days, along with the other team members working out the logistics for both, shore, both shows all at the same time. Yeah, Matt is another proud Cyclone alum, like a lot of the Farm Progress crew, graduating from Iowa State University, and he's been with Farm Progress for more than just a couple years. Matt also farms in Illinois, so he does a lot of double duty, and not only does he understand the farm show world as the manager, as the national manager, but he also wears his farmer's cap. So welcome, Matt, to FP Next. Good to be with you guys. I love your show. This is great. Well, Matt, and, and you get to be in on kind of this uh, new video version, you know, so that's that's kind of a cool thing, too. And we're really glad to have you on today um, because you farm and uh, you're quite busy right now getting ready for Farm Progress Show. Um, how do you juggle these things all at once? I'm guessing some of your farm show work gets done from a tractor cab. And also, you know, we're always interested. What do the crops look like in your neck of the woods this year? Well, you're you're exactly right, Kurt. Um, you know, it it's a pretty unique job. Uh, you know, the the cycle of things, as you mentioned, we're always working on on something to do with these shows year round. Uh, but after Husker Harvest Days, it's kind of a nice opportunity for me to decompress, to come home from the shows at the end of Husker Harvest Days, and realistically, other than paying bills and kind of cleaning up my phone stops ringing in the middle of, you know, late September. And so I get to take a little bit of a break and climb in the auger car tractor. And you guys have probably all seen me on conference calls from the cab of, of the tractor. And that's, that's, that's what I'm doing there for a few weeks after the show. But um, great that, you know, we all at Farm Progress for the most part work from home and have that kind of flexibility to get the job done. But it does, you know, keep me close to the industry. You know, all the, all of our readers and all of our customers, the same decisions made, around their kitchen tables are being made around our kitchen tables too. So it, it's pretty good to stay uh, that close to the show. So it, it's, it, it's a nice mix and, and um, it's, you know, it's a really good team that I'm fortunate enough to work with our, our close team that does the shows. And then this time of year, it seems like the whole company is working on farm shows right now, you know, whether it's, it's Kurt and Mindy working on the Husker show program, or it's, Holly and Gil and, and the rest of that team working on the Farm Progress Show program, everybody in accounting and marketing and everybody's kind of leans in and is de facto show team folks for a few few weeks or a month here. I know. I think a lot of us have either done like the tractor cab, the truck, some field day. We all kind of work from everywhere. So it's always nice. And as we always talk about 
everyone's farms and like the weather and crop conditions. We also like to talk about local eating establishments and food, of course, here at FP Next. So what's your favorite place around home to grab a burger? Uh, favorite place around home is right here, a little town in little town of Little York. Um, they, they, at the, the Sweetwater, they serve our hamburgers from our farm there at, at, at the, at the bar here in town. So that, that's kind of my, I, I have to promote Sumner Point Beef a little bit. That's our, that's our, uh, farm to, to consumer business here at, at, at uh, our farm. So I've got to promote them, but, but my favorite, you know, I've been, I've been preparing for that question. Cause I listened, I knew you guys would ask me what, what's my favorite burger, my favorite burger. And Kurt may know this one is at a little place in grand Island called the bunk house. And it's, it's maybe not necessarily, it, it's a good burger, but the reason I love that burger is because Friday after Husker harvest days at the end of all this chaos that we're getting ready to sign up for the Libby, the Libby team and the team that puts together Husker harvest days, we all go to the bunkhouse for lunch. And the goal is to get all my stuff wrapped up and they kick me out at lunchtime on Friday, <laughs> the day after Husker harvest days, we all go to the bunkhouse, have a cheeseburger and nachos with jalapenos. And then I jump in the truck and I get to go home after this, this big run of farm shows. So um, that, that bunkhouse burger off of old 30 there in Grand Island is my favorite burger of the year. You know, I have a hard time disagreeing with you. That is one of the best. Absolutely. So, so Sarah, you got to mark these down on our list, you know, cause we want to do a food tour someday and, and hit all these establishments that everybody keeps promoting, but yeah, the bunkhouse is, is awesome. So I, I can see why that's one of your favorites. So, you know, we always talk about yep, your place around it. homes. So you already mentioned, you know, one in Grand Island, but how about like of the farm shows? Do you have some favorite favorite food joints at between the farm shows or favorite dishes maybe. And, and I can think of a couple that you might yep. say. Yep. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of, you, you get to know these communities that you, that you live in. I mean, I've, I've spent a whole lot of my life in Decatur, Illinois and Boone, Iowa and Grand Island, Nebraska. Um, you know, people kind of know if I'm, if I've got a lunch meeting or something, they know where to find me. If we're in Boone, then I'm probably at the Colorado Grill having a steak salad because they've got an excellent steak salad with a with a homemade Parmesan garlic uh, salad dressing that's just incredible. Um, and then when we're in Decatur, uh, the place is called Doherty's and they have, uh, you know, I'm not much of a soup guy, but they have a pepper Gouda soup that is just amazing. And so whatever else you're having is great, but be sure not to miss the pepper gouda soup there at Doherty's in Decatur. If, if I'm having a lunch date or a lunch meeting or anything going on, it's all there at one of those places in those towns. <laughs> I know we were just joking about how in our last episode, we were talking with Liz about the pork palace and then Matt actually corrected it. It's the pork place at Husker harvest days. Um, and so everyone who's attending any of these farm shows and listening, you should have a lot of options, especially at the shows and in the communities, but before we get down to the nitty gritties of getting the most out of farm show season, tell us a little bit about your family on the farm. How are your kids doing? Kids are kids are doing great. And and Kurt asked me how for a crop report here in Western Illinois, and and I, I missed out on answering that. We're we've had a pretty good year so far. The two previous years, planting went perfectly. It didn't exactly go perfectly this year. We had to plant around some wet holes, and you know it's it's a little bit more normal where we don't necessarily get done planting. We just quit planting the same wet holes over and over and over and just, yeah. just call it a day there at some point in June. And so we that that's a little more normal for us. We're pretty close to the Mississippi, so we've got a lot of rolling ground and some creek bottoms that, that, that we'll lose some of. But um, the stuff that got planted and got up, you know, which is the majority of the crop, obviously, it all looks pretty good. Um, the, the field here next to my house, I don't know if you'll hear the airplanes flying over, but the fungicide is going on that field right now as we speak. And it's, it's that season we've gotten through the beans with the insecticide and fungicide. And now we're just kind of, kind of keeping an eye on things, but, but generally things here in Western Illinois look pretty good. Um, and then, you know, crop report from Boone is that that crop looks great. It was all in the ground on April 12th and it's maturing nicely right now. It's, it's, at dent, it's starting to dent and start to fire a little bit. So it's going to be perfect for harvest demos. And Kurt, you saw the, the crop out at Husker. It, it got a little bit dinged up with some hail, but otherwise it's going to be just fine for the field demos. The alfalfa looks good. Parking lots look good. They've gotten a lot of rain in Grand Island, a lot more than normal. 
And so the everything's everything's greener than it normally is on my July tip trip to Grand Island. But you asked about about the family. Um, I I married a gal here from here in Western. I grew, I grew up in Central Iowa. Graduated from Iowa State. Met Crystal, my wife, at the Farm Progress show actually in the year two thousand. And she was working for Farm Progress. It's, you know, in, in 30 years of working for this company, it's the best thing I've taken from it is meeting my wife. But her family farms here in Western Illinois. So we've settled back here. And uh, it's the farm is is my wife and my brother-in-law and my father-in-law. And then all those families. And we've got a couple hired men that do an amazing job. And and I'm just I'm just a little bit of go for help in the spring and fall. I run the grain cart in the in the fall, and I'm in charge of keeping the planter running with the seed tender in the spring because those two jobs allow me to keep up with what we call the real job. What we're talking about here is what we call the real job at the farm, and we've we've figured out in the fall a real good way that if I'm on a call or I'm 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 too busy to for the radio to talk on the two way or something. I'll turn the beacons on on the tractor, and that that means everybody on the farm up in the field knows that I'm not available, but I'll still be I'll, I'll still be running the grain cart through conference calls and things. We've got three kids. Uh, Jack, our oldest, is a soft is going to be a sophomore at the University of Illinois studying ag com. Luke, our middle, he's going to be a freshman at the University of Illinois. They're both in farmhouse fraternity, and they're getting ready to move off to Champaign here in the next week or two. And then our youngest, Kate, she's going to be a sophomore here at, at, in high school. And uh, it's going to be Crystal and Kate and me when we send the boys off, which is going to be kind of nice, I think, for Kate. She's going to be an only child for a while. So she's I think she's looking forward to that. And uh, she's got her she got her little um, uh, uh, Labradoodle, Australian, uh, Australian Labradoodle. That's that's her pup. And so it'll, it, it, it'll be a much smaller, quieter family here when those boys go off to college. Yeah, Matt, you're kind of in the same situation as me. I'm sending our third off to college. And so our, our youngest, who will be an eighth grader, he's he's kind of like an only only child this year. So that'll be quite different. Um, also, I love the story about meeting your wife at Farm Progress Show. How fitting is that? huh? We hear those stories all the time about you know, people uh, not only meeting, but like actually getting engaged at Farm Progress Show or Husker Harvest Days, or, you know, that's on their wedding anniversary every year, and they just go to the show shows every year. It's just kind of interesting how those farm shows have kind of been woven into people's lives. And that's, that's kind of a, a cool legacy to hear about, I think. Um, you know, we know that you work all year long on the shows. You may have a little downtime after after Grand Island, but certainly you work all year long. But certainly crunch time is coming. I mean, especially for Farm Progress Show, which is first out of the gate here very soon. Um, what are you working on now related to the Farm Progress Show and coming up in Boone? And what are some of the new things, unique things that uh, Farm Progress Show visitors are going to see this year? And we know there's plenty. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the planning for the shows, realistically, the planning for the 2025 show started in Decatur because, you know, in on about Wednesday of the show, you can't really, by Wednesday afternoon, if it's not fixed, it's not going to get fixed. And, and, and everybody's mind, you know, everybody's mind switches to the next thing, whether that's Husker in two weeks or, you know, that's next year in Decatur 25 or, you know, it, I'll be having conversations by Wednesday of the Farm Progress Show, I'll be having 2026 conversations because people will come to me and say, hey, next time we're here in Boone, I want to do this or I'm going to need this or I'm going to need to move over here or, or you know, things things for future shows are already already being planned um, pretty, pretty quickly. But right now, you know, the joke that the joke that I've kind of fostered within our group is that. When the show program goes to print, which just happened, the Farm Progress show program just shipped off to the printer here just like hours, within hours of go. That is when we have the ceremonial shooting of the Good Idea Fairy. We have no more good ideas, and we just go to work on implementing whatever the plan is that's published in that show program. So honestly, right now, we're at kind of that transition point where we're not we're not planning anymore. We're not creating new things. We're not working on the next, you know, reinventing the wheel. We are going to work on implementing the show. And, you know, the, the first semi loads of tents have already arrived in, in Boone and Rick is there on site living and he's going to be there for two months or more or longer um, building that thing up and, and then tearing it back down. And so it, it's a lot of that transition of going from 
creating it and creating the plan to actually implementing things. So, but so you know, Peyton is, is working. She does all the behind the scenes things to make the thing happen. So it's a lot of getting gear lined up for everybody, answering a lot of phone calls, getting hotel rooms locked in and, and transitioning to shipping things out and that kind of thing. All the pins and passes and everything that we need to, to get out to the exhibitors is, is underway. Dina is transitioning from selling all the sponsorships and getting them contracted and signed and things. She's now switching over and starting to make the signage and make the activations that make those those sponsorship happen. Obviously, Rick is is physically on site and he's got, as of yesterday, he had a quarter of the show site staked out already. So that's the kind of things that that are happening just just right now as we're on the cusp of it happening. Um, you know, the one of the cool things there's there's always there's always cool things that make each show unique. It was last year. We, I got a call or I got, I, some, somebody reached out to me somehow, but what it turned into was somebody's dying wish was to have their ashes spread at the case IH exhibit at the farm progress show. And so, you know, work with that person to get something done after hours. We actually did it before show hours and work with case to get it approved. And so you're, you're always kind of working on, some unique new thing that's I've, I've done this for this will be the 30th year i've done something with the farm progress show and and part of the reason is because every day there's some fresh new thing that's hitting my inbox of of of, of some way to keep this fresh and new and and a lot of it has had to do with technology as it evolves over the year of creating new ways for folks to market the thing that are coming to market um, but you know, this year, one of the cool new things that Rick has been working on on site at, at farm progress show is the air tractor. Everybody's seen those big yellow airplanes that those are all built by a company called air tractor. They've never exhibited at farm progress show before, but they're going to come this year. So we're actually going to land a, a crop sprayer in the parking lot and have, have a bunch of fence ripped out on the edge of the show site and pull the airplane into the show site and put the fence back together and have, have a crop duster there on display at the show, which that, that's, that's kind of one of the cool new ones that operationally we get to work on. That is so cool. And I know you beat us to the air tractor punch. We were going to talk about that a little bit more in depth and I have to hear more about how logistically that's going to work, but the Farm Progress Show is more than 70 years old, and of course, it's the nation's largest outdoor farm event, and that is a pretty rich history for the show. Can you tell us a little bit about how it all got started and how it's evolved over the years? Absolutely. So it, it started in 1953 in Armstrong, Illinois, and and the idea was that at the time, it was, it was the end of hand corn husking contests, you know, before the Farm Progress Show and before mechanization, a hand horn, corn husking contest was something that everybody came out to view. Well, that was kind of fading away and mechanization was, was obviously well on the way in agriculture. And Prairie Farmer, which is our Illinois publication, the editor and sales staff and, and the president of Prairie Farmer decided they wanted an opportunity for the advertisers in Prairie Farmer to have a hands-on day with the farmers that read the magazine. And they hoped to get 10 or 20,000 people to the show. Lo and behold, 70,000 showed up and they ran out of food and they didn't have enough bathrooms, didn't have enough parking. And so it was a, it was a great success. And so from then on, uh, it, the show has grown. At that time, it, it, the first couple shows were in Illinois and then they, then they added Indiana to the rotation and Prairie Farmer and Indiana Prairie Farmer were the hosts. In 1959, our company bought Wallace's Farmer, which is our Iowa publication. So Clarence, Iowa in 1959 was the first edition adding Iowa to the rotation. So from 1959 to 2004, the show rotated between Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana. And it always went into a cornfield. You know, uh, back back when I started with the company in the mid 90s, in the mid 90s, you would pull into a community in January and spend nine months creating traffic routes and recruiting food, you know, food stand folks and burying power lines and water lines and phone lines to create a show site out in a cornfield. And that's what we did. And until the 50th anniversary in 2003, uh, the first show back in 1953 was a one day show. And ironically, the 50th anniversary show, we had an amazing Tuesday 
And then the rest of the show rained completely out. So the 50th was a one day show as well. It just wasn't by design that way. After that, after that 50th anniversary show in 2003, the exhibitors came to us and said, we can't continue to invest the kind of money we're investing into these exhibits and truck all this equipment in and bring all this staff in if the show is that is has that much risk associated with it. So we very quickly, my boss, Don and I, and, and the rest of the team went to work on finding a way to add permanence to the show site. And, and so we sent out bids um, to communities asking them to propose their solution to host the show. And Decatur came back and honestly made it impossible for us not to go to Decatur. The, the plan was we were gonna find a place on the, on the Illinois Indiana border uh, and then find a place in Iowa and rotate between two sites because we we thought we were going to have to invest, you know, $10 million into each show site. And we didn't want to build three of them and only get use out of it every three years. So we were going to do two of them. So, you know, Lafayette and Rantoul and Terre Haute. And, and then because at that time, Prairie Farmer was based in Decatur, we gave Decatur an opportunity to bid on it as well. So, Decatur bid on it and just said, we're going to build it for you in the first year and have it ready to go. And so, you know, in, in late in right after the 2004 show, we announced Decatur and then very quickly built that thing in about six months and had the 2005 show in Decatur, Illinois. So it was a pretty fast turnaround to get the, the first permanent site built. We were so activated on that 05 show that it took we didn't get Iowa activated quickly enough for 2006. So we went to Amana in 2006 and went to work on Boone and had our Boone show site in 2008. And so that's where we've now set down permanent routes in Decatur and in, uh, in Boone, Iowa. And the other thing that I, the other, so that's, that's a huge change in the history of the event. The other big change in the history of the event is changing of the dates. When I first started doing this show, it was at the end of September. And harvest kept getting earlier and earlier and earlier. And a lot of times at the end of September, the farmers like now, this year will be hard at it in the field by the end of September. So in 2000, well, in 2004, we changed show dates to the end of August instead of the end of September. And that's, that's really helped the show out a lot because the farmers certainly have time to come to the event right there at the end of August. It, it's made it tighter and harder to get a crop ready but it's still a better show because everybody for sure has time to come to the event. Yeah, I had, I had the opportunity to work at several Farm Progress shows over the years uh, on the new products editorial team. So I was in Decatur once, twice in Boone. And, uh, you know, those show sites are just beautiful. I mean, they really make it easy to get around. The streets are so nice and and uh, easy to get in and out of the exhibitor booths. And, and uh, what, you know, what great, showgrounds they both are um i will say one of those years we had a little rain i think it was in boone and uh, mindy ward uh at missouri ruralist our senior editor she and i were driving onto the showgrounds and i think we pushed a couple vans out of a couple greasy spots in the parking lot but i mean you know you have an outdoor farm show you're kind of at the mercy a little bit of the weather um obviously that's a kind of a big deal it's probably something you spend a lot of time thinking about and planning for but <clears throat> these show sites, the way they're set up, uh, Farm Progress Show and Husker Harvest Days now, after all this investment in the showgrounds, I mean, uh, they are not weatherproof, but certainly they are weather resilient in a lot of ways, right? Yeah, so you, you're exactly right. It's an it's still an outdoor event, and you know, if there's lightning strike or pouring down rain or high winds, it's still it's still susceptible to the weather. No different than a a golf tournament or a NASCAR race or a football game or anything else, we can still have mother nature affect us, but we're certainly more, I like your word resilient. Um, the, the thing about it is if, if you think back, if the, the veterans of the farm progress show would remember 1994 in Bloomington or 97 in Seneca or 2000 in Springfield, Illinois, the problem is if you get rain during setup, we would destroy the show site before the first visitor ever set foot on the grounds. Just getting the semis drug in to set it up and the forklifts and rut everything up and ruin it. And so now at least we're able to get the thing set up without tearing it up. And we keep the parking lots pretty protected during setup so that that's a fresh, clean parking lot that when the visitors first start pulling in. So it's allowed us to, to not tear it up just getting getting the thing getting the thing built and I, I would say 
Kurt, um, you know, we built Decatur first and we made some mistakes in building a permanent show site. And then in 2008, we built Boone and we made less mistakes. But I would say the rehab, the, the renovation that we did to Husker Harvest Days in 2018, we had learned from all of those mistakes made in Decatur and Boone. And the facility, in terms of facilities, the facility in Grand Island is better than those two. I don't, I don't know of a better outdoor trade show facility than the one that we have now in Grand Island. It, in my opinion, it's the best one, not, not just in the U.S., it's the best one in the world. And I've had the opportunity to be to a few farm shows around the world. And that Husker site is, is, is the best one that I know of. I know I was just at a field day yesterday and we were actually talking about farm show grounds and like the dust and the rain and they mentioned how much they enjoyed those paved roads at Husker Harvest Days and the grounds of the farm shows, both to make sure we're not pushing cars. I remember when I first started, we were renting cars to drive down there. Mindy told me I had to get something four wheel drive because we were not pushing editors' cars out of the lots. <laughs> so it's always nice to enjoy like those nice facilities. And so Kurt and I are usually on the new product teams at the show. So we get to walk the grounds a lot looking for the latest and greatest tech and products. And there's always plenty of unveilings of new machinery and innovations at Farm Progress Show and Husker Harvest Days. But at Farm Progress Show, you kind of tease it a little bit. Share a little bit more about this air tractor and what farmers and exhibitors can expect to see from that. That's, it's really great to have them. And we've, we've placed them right at the Northwest corner of the show site. So if you come in gate nine, which is the Northwest corner of the Boone show site, uh, we placed them there so that we can logistically easily get them into the show, get get the airplane into the show. But it's, you know, that's kind of one of those behind the scenes things that you don't necessarily think of when you're when you're walking the show. Hopefully everybody just thinks this all magically happens. And I don't really do much for a living because everything works right and traffic flows smoothly and everything like that. But you wouldn't think that that airplane is going to get built at the factory in Texas and it's going to fly up to the Boone show site. And as soon as we get the third cutting of hay off the parking lot, it's it, the, the airplane sitting in Boone at the Boone airport waiting on us. As soon as that, that third cutting comes off, they're going to fire it up and, and land it right there in the parking lot, right on the North side of the show site, spin it around and, and drive it into the show and into the exhibit space. And, and there it will sit. It's going to sit there for about a month. Uh, until we can get done with the show and then safely get the thing get the thing moved back out. But you know, I have never been up close and personal with a with a crop duster and the technology that that allows the pilots to to fly them correctly and and everything in terms of the product disp disbursement and everything else that goes into to one of those machines. So to get up close and personal is kind of one of those things. Um, you know, I always have a few things that I want to go check out as, as, a, as with my farmer hat or things that maybe my, my wife assigns me to go figure out. But I, th that's one that I'm assigning to myself is to, to, to kind of get up close and personal with that thing and, and understand the technology of it a little bit better. So, Matt, you know, today with with the autonomy zone, all the you know, different drone demonstrations, that kind of thing, that's, you know, I remember seeing my first drone actually at uh, Husker Harvest Days. And that's the first time I'd ever seen one. And, uh, you know, when you start talking about these working farm shows, I mean, you know, what was the tech that you can remember being unveiled for the first time at a farm show and kind of compare, you know, from the old, the old days, you know, not that long ago, but a little while ago compared to what we're seeing today? Well, you know, way back in the 1900s, when I first started doing this, the, the, the technology that, that you had, the, the, the cool hot thing were, were light bars and kind of the beginning, the beginnings of auto steer, right? The, you know, GPS controlling things. That was Star Wars, Star Trek type technology that nobody believed would, you know, the, you know, you would you would very commonly hear a farmer say, well, if I can't drive a tractor, I, what am I doing this for? I, I'll drive my own tractor. I don't need a computer to do it for me. And that was what you heard in the mid 1990s. And, and then kind of slowly over time, auto steer became more of a common thing. And then pretty soon you would see stickers on the cab that would say auto steer ready or something along those lines. And now to buy a tractor that is, doesn't have auto steer embedded in it and and a part of the package is is unheard of right that everything's got it and and we found out on may 11th this year when we had the big solar flare storm and the gps signals went down our planter wouldn't plant because it was so 
dependent on GPS. We had to figure, we had to set the markers and do all kinds of things that we did we had not done for a, for about a planting season and a half. So, you know, over time, our even our farm became dependent on GPS and that kind of thing. And so that adoption curve where you went from light bars to where it is it is integral in the operation of the equipment that's taken 30 years to get there to where an auto steer and gps is is like that it's interesting we're right now at the beginning of that with autonomy right there's going to be another adoption curve over time and i don't tend to think that it's going to take 30 years because you already have trackers coming out just a few years into the process that are already kind of autonomy ready they're autonomous ready or they can be made autonomous ready very easily so that watching that adoption curve happen faster now is is going to be really really interesting and at the same time you know we talk about auto steer back in the 1990s that was you know the that was the year that uh, of the first bt and roundup ready was the year before roundup ready beans were the year before that so you know just i was right there on the beginning of traits and and auto steer and so you know it's been quite a ride to to watch this technology evolve over time and to be part of husker harvest days and the farm progress show all these companies are pretty aggressive marketers and they want to pretty aggressively figure out ways to sell their equipment and we have to write rules for brand new technologies that want to compete with each other, which has been pretty interesting because we've got a lot of masters we have to worry about. We've got to keep the crowd safe. We've got to be fair to all the competitors in there, no matter how big of an exhibitor they are or small or new. And, and we've got to make sure that the thing actually works and that we're not promoting something that isn't real. And so, you know, it, it, it's been, it's been interesting to kind of have to write the rules on how to, allow these companies to compete in a head-to-head -head competition when they're all trying to market and sell their own unique version uh, of all these things. You know, the, the first 2017, when we had our first autonomous machine, I said, you know, I made them bring it a week and a half early and I made them go out into the parking lot and, and drive the thing at me to prove that it wasn't going to run me over. And it pulled right up to me and came to a stop and took a picture of me and sent it to the guy in the combine and, and said, should I run this over? And he thankfully said, no, you shouldn't. And then, and so that was me testing out the, the autonomous machines to make sure that they were safe to have in and amongst our crowd. Just really putting that tech to the test, just right in the line of fire. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, so, and then of course this year, the Farm Progress Show is in Boone, Iowa, August 27th to the 29th. And like you said, next year we'll rotate back to Decatur. And then two weeks later, you guys have a really long stretch of farm shows and it'll be Husker Harvest Days in Grand Island, which is September 10th through the 12th. Kurt and I will both be there this year, of course, at Husker, along with a, a ton of other members from our Farm Progress team. And I've been hearing a lot about some of the changes this year. You kind of talked a little bit about the crops, but there's some cover crops um, that are going to be going on, grain bagging, a lot of new things that are going to be added at Husker this year. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, really excited about Husker Harvest Days this year. You know, it 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 is the the, the thing that's that's interesting about any of these shows is that the farm show is for the people pretty much within a three hour drive time. You know, some of them are more global than others and national than others, but for the most part, you know, there's a lot of license plate in that parking lot of people who got up that morning at their farm or ranch and drove to Grand Island, Nebraska and spent the day at the show. And then they're gonna get home in time to do chores that night. And so the show represents the agriculture happening around it. So if you're in, if you're in Hall County, Nebraska and Grand Island, Nebraska, there is a lot of, of irrigated row crop and there's a whole lot of beef in, in there. And so the show kind of reflects that, that whole Northwest quarter of the grounds is, is the beef showcase this, you know, we've kind of renamed it, but it's always been the beef showcase up there in the Northwest quarter. And then, you know, to change the name of the livestock industries building to the beef building with our magazine beef magazine and the beef assets that the company owns it's a no-brainer and i don't know why we didn't do it a long time ago to tie the beef brand to that building and so you know bringing that the beef team they're doing the, the some of the content that's happening between the cattle handling demonstrations and they're putting a lot of emphasis and energy into training and education and and everything beef centric and in into that area so really excited about that you mentioned the cover crops that 
that's an idea that the Kurtz worked closely with with us on. And, you know, he, he's been a bit of the lead on that. Um, but, you know, the first of that is already in the ground. I think there's going to be, you know, several dozen varieties, you know, strains and mixes of cover crops. Half of them are already planted and up and, and looking really good. And then they're going to have a delayed planting for, for the rest of it here in a few weeks. But, uh, you know, an opportunity if you're in looking for cover crops, whether you're in the beef operation or you're a, you're a crop guy, um, you'll have a chance to kind of take a look at all of these different cover crop varieties and mixes and and walk through them and, and kind of get up close and personal with the experts there and talk through it with them. Have, we're going to have a couple of, of plot walks every day, one for the beef operations and one for the crop operations. So that's that's a really cool addition to the show. And then you know, the thing about Husker Harvest Days is I, I've had the opportunity to be at farm shows around the globe. And I I'm, I don't know of any show that's even close to having as much interactive stuff going on. We have corn harvest and tillage and strip till, as well as all the haying demonstrations, cattle handling, horse gentling, stock dogs, strip, you know, strip till, ride and drive. Um, it, it, there's just so much going on around every corner of every part of the show site. We've got a live grain handling set up with, with grain drying happening throughout all, all day, every day. So it, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful show. And I would invite anybody who, who has it on their bucket list. This is going to be a great year to come to the show. Yeah, I, I can't disagree with you. I've been attending Husker since, since the eighties, I guess. Uh, my folks, I think went to the very first show in 78 and then you know when i was old enough i went with my dad eventually with my wife and then the last 14 years you know as part of the team which has been a lot of fun um husker isn't as old as farm progress show but it's it'll get to its 50 year mark not too far down the road here and it's kind of unique as you say uh representing the western corn belt more cattle crops and community as the theme says um can you tell us just a little bit about the history of husker harvest days yeah, so like you said, it started in 1978, and it was um, a couple things kind of kind of came together to to make that happen. There was a there was a drive there in central Nebraska, whether it be Hastings or Grand Island, that that they wanted to start a farm show for the Western Corn Belt because you know at at that time there in in the late 70s. That's about the time the Farm Science Review in Ohio started and about the time that Sunbelt started. So there were some and all those shows are kind of a copy of the Farm Progress show to the mm -hmm. point that Husker Harvest Days wasn't in the Farm Progress portfolio at that time. It was started independent of Farm Progress. We just happened to buy it in, in I think, in the, the mid 80s. But um the the lot sizes are the same size the street layouts are the same so there are parts of it that are pretty much a carbon copy of farm progress show which makes it easy for us to manage it obviously but a, a, the business leaders there in grand island centered around a group in the chamber of commerce called the ag institute of nebraska they uh they wanted to start a farm show and so they scouted farm progress show and took a lot of pictures and and got to work on building a show site. And it just so happens at the same time, the Cornhusker ammunition plant was being shuttered and the army was shutting that down and they wanted to find a use for a whole lot of acres out there west of Grand Island. So they identified a, a portion of the Cornhusker ammunition plant and it was kind of given over to the chamber and they started this farm show back in the seventies. And, you know, there's, there's the shows, the show's, been around since 1978 so that means there's a whole lot of people that were around in 1978 that can tell you all the stories of what it took to get the thing off the ground and there's there's some pretty interesting stories of all the things that happened over the course of time to, to grow that show but you know when i stepped into the role of managing that in 2004 we weren't using the whole the whole show site and slowly over the last 20 years we've started to use more and more of it we've even added streets and then did that big renovation in 2018 and so it is a it's a tremendous facility where it's it's something that we're very proud of is the infrastructure there that allows for everybody to put on a really good show I'm a lot newer to farm shows than Kurt and Matt you guys are but I love to hear all the unique history about the shows cuz you know you go and then you never realize like, oh, this used to be an ammunition plant. So I think that's really interesting. And then, of course, there's plenty about the agronomy world and crop products at the farm shows. 
But one of the things I love the most about Husker is it is full of farmers and ranchers. I have a little bit more of a livestock background than the crop side. So I love to see like what those ranchers have their priorities set on, if they're whether looking through new products or new balers, whatever it might be. Um, and then kind of mirror that with what are the crop guys looking for? And then, of course, those in the Western states who irrigate their land sure appreciate all the irrigation tech at the show every year, Husker Harvest Days. You know, those irrigation companies have massive setups to really demonstrate their products and tech to show attendees. What can visitors expect to see on the irrigation side this year? Well, you're you're exactly right. I mean, the the, the big four that the big four pivot companies, this is the biggest exhibit they put up anywhere in around around the world. And and so all four of them, and, and mo, you know, they're all based there in, in central Nebraska or eastern Nebraska. And, you know, if you look at their market, the Husker Harvest Days is just right dead center in the middle of, of their their marketing area. And so they want to all put their best foot forward and show off their latest technologies. And, and, you know, as a farmer in Western Illinois, I don't have to know anything about any of this irrigation stuff, but I go out and, and hang out with Jason Libby who farms it every day. And he's showing me, you know, moisture probes from his farms and he's showing me how, you know, the days his crop is taking a drink and, and just the technology that's involved in, in row crop irrigation is just fascinating to me. And the, the, you know, the work that it takes, you know, Honestly, we put our crop in the ground to spray it a couple of times and we're good, but it's like a dairy farm a little bit. Every day you have to make sure that you're tending to those pivots and gearboxes go out. And so, I mean, I have a ton of respect for those folks that they are growing, they're growing fantastic crops, but there's a lot of stress and strain and input and cost associated to it because it's so much more involved than anything we're doing here where we just stand around and get 40 inches of rain without doing anything about it. They, it takes a lot of work to, to get that crop, a lot more work than we have to do to get that crop put together. So uh, that technology is just fascinating to me. And, and I, I love learning about it as, as kind of an outsider. It takes, it takes 20 years before they'll even accept you as kind of an outsider. It's taken that long to get established in, in Grand Island. But I think that some, of, some have adopted me um, as, as, a, as a little bit of a Nebraskan out there. I love it. And I know one thing too, we talked about the show sites and all the work that goes into it, but also a big focus of the farm shows is making sure exhibitors and attendees are comfortable and having fun. And so besides those demonstrations we discussed already, like the horse gentling, the canine stars, and if you don't want to get 10,000 steps in walking that whole show site, the hospitality tents at Farm Progress Show and Husker Harvest States have speakers and sessions and events going on in the tent throughout the show. At the Farm Progress Show, attendees can listen to the USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack, Max Armstrong, and Mike Pearson of Farm Progress hosting This Week in Agribusiness and The Noon Show. And there's also sessions on regenerative ag, research and ag tech, and so much more. And then the hospitality tent at Husker Harvest Days is covering grain marketing, federal policy, Nebraska Farmer Hour, and perhaps the most exciting is we're recording a live episode of FP Next on the stage. And so, Matt, how have those hospitality tents been around have they been around for a long time or are they a newer addition to the shows? They've been around for a long time, but they've really evolved and, and quickly here in the last couple of years. I mean, we all three work pretty closely with the folks in the marketing department and, you know, they are they are working really, really hard to make those tents really interactive, really enjoy a, an enjoyable place to rest and learn and, and you know, maybe see some celebrities here and there and, and kind of the their no matter what show you're at, they're in the center of the grounds, but they're trying to make it even more of a hub of entertainment and learning. And, and so really appreciate the work that Emily and her team are doing to, to make all of these things better and more interactive and, and serve our customers well. Give, up, give them a nice um, non-commercial hub base, home base within the show. And, you know, uh, they also kind of serve as a good place for our many international visitors, especially at Farm Progress Show, where we just got a huge amount of international folks visiting. And it's a good place for them to kind of stop in and, and touch base with Farm Progress, too. Um, Sarah and I were talking about the livestock side of Husker Harvest Days. And, um, you know, we already kind of alluded to the, the talk about the, the Livestock Industries building being renamed um, the Beef 
building. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how that came about and what that means to the show? I mean, I saw the lineup of speakers that are going to be along with the cattle handling. There's also going to be a number of speakers uh, at that beef building. It's going to be a really great addition to Husker this year. It is, you know, we, we've, we've been, you know, trying to master how to provide that content and, and make it be something that's engaging and interesting for everybody and that, that makes them want to stick around and, and, and learn a little bit and, and folding beef into Husker Harvest Days is, is such a natural fit um, that honestly, I'm a little bit ashamed of all of us that we didn't just, just do it a long time ago because, you know, that beef brand is such a perfect fit and such a perfect tie for Husker Harvest Days and to, to co-market each other and, you know, show that tie and, and, you know, work with the content folks and Sarah's team that, that, that works on beef. It's, it's a perfect fit and really excited about, you know, it's not just a one year thing. It, this is a, this is a really cool, good, long-term thing that, as you mentioned, Kurt, it, for, for the time being, it's a rebrand, but when we when we revive the Good Idea Ferry here in a few months, going forward into the future, I'm I'm looking forward to what else can it become? What else can we do, or what else should we be doing to further tie beef? We've spent a whole lot of time marketing Husker Harvest Days as a row crop irrigation show, which it most certainly is, but it's also a heck of a beef show. Um, you know, the folks around here in Western Illinois that I have sent off to Husker who've listened to me who would go. They come home with a brand new head shoot in the back of their truck from a company that they didn't even know existed, but they bought it out there at Husker Harvest Days because it's such a great beef show. And um, beef is a huge industry, and we need to figure out better ways to serve it with this great event that we have going on there in September in Grand Island. I know looking at that beef building lineup, it's chock full of learn opportunities for ranchers and cattlemen. Doesn't matter how long you've been ranching, the size of your ranch. And so there's, of course, the shoot demos that happen every year, discussions on cattle marketing, low stress cattle handling, how to combine innovation and tradition and reframe your perspective. A lot of great stuff. And we're just super excited to see more of this building in person at Husker. And if you are at the showgrounds looking for it, Matt already said, but it's in the northwest quadrant of the showgrounds where it was usually formerly the, the Livestock Industries building. Was that the old name, right? That's exactly right. Perfect. Yep. And right near all the, the beef breed associations and their displays, you know, so it's kind of just in the right area, um, you know, of the showgrounds. If, you, if you're in the livestock mood, that's for sure. Um, Matt, you know, we yep. know you have a lot of stories having having worked at the shows all these years. Uh, maybe you could share some insights or at least some entertaining, couple entertaining stories about the shows. And I think some of those probably help us understand, you know, how it takes really an entire team, lots of folks yes with farm progress but also locally and a lot of volunteers um, that work to make these shows happen and like you have alluded to not really said but alluded to you know all the coordination it takes with local agencies on the ground at the shows i mean it's a that's a big deal but it also creates some great friendships and and some cool stories i'm sure yeah there's there's there, I could tell you stories until the cows come home, Kurt, and and most of them I probably shouldn't tell you on, you know, on on a national broadcast here. But yeah, it, you know, the the evolution of this over the years has been really cool. But but part of that has to do with the fact that it's a lot of the same people for the last, you know. 15, 20, 25, 30 years that that have have, have made this go. You know, in in Nebraska. The Libby family has been taking care of that show site for the last 40 years. And, and that's, you know, we're approaching the 50th anniversary of the show. So obviously almost all of the Husker Harvest Days events have been touched by that family. And so they are like family. And, and you know, whether you're in the, in the show office at Farm Progress or Husker, or I've seen it at other shows, the people that come together every year to make these events happen it is like a family reunion in that show office every year. You know, every year the 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 wints come back to do the elect electricity at Farm Progress show, and the pressure washers come back, and Barb from Xylem that's doing the landscaping, and you know all the people that it takes to to put the event on, or even you know the exhibitors, Amy at, at Bear, and and you know all all the people that you work with, Doug at Pioneer, and everybody that you work with day in day out. Um, you know, I'm, I'm meeting with them at other places, but the family reunion happens at Farm Progress Show and Husker Harvest Days and everybody comes back together. And 
with you you go through a lot of battles with these folks too, because not battles with each other, but probably battles with mother nature, or, you know, they've had, they've had some stressful thing happen. The, a generator for their air conditioning blows out in the middle of the show. And we got to figure out a way to get the thing replaced in the middle of show hours. So it's a big undertaking to get that done. Or, you know, I've had to ask for some favors from some exhibitor partners when, the parking lots are muddy and we need help pushing vehicles out or we have a big windstorm in 2007 at Husker Harvest Days overnight and it blows the New Holland exhibit clear apart. And so other exhibitors are coming and helping clean up and put get the show put back together just so we can get the thing opened up at eight o'clock in the morning. Or you have like 2004 when when George W. Bush came to the Farm Progress show, that's a big strain on everybody. You know, the, the Secret Service can make life really rough and instill some rules that make putting together a show pretty difficult. And so you work through those things together with these people. And a lot of them can tell you a lot of those same stories and they might have a totally different angle on it and, and, and had a, you know, a rougher and easier time than I did on them, but we've all been through that stuff together. And so working with folks back to 1998, I still work with folks when I manage the show in Tipton, Indiana, that, that show was held on ground that was owned by MetLife. So the MetLife blimp was there at the show site. So I had the opportunity to take a ride in the MetLife blimp and, you know, got a few of my friends up in the, in the, in the cab of that thing to last year. Uh, we had a, we had a farmer fly into Husker harvest days from Colorado and Peyton, who was new on our team doing her first Husker harvest days had never been in a helicopter. So I begged a favor from that farmer from Colorado and got her up in, in a helicopter. And so, you know, it's a, it's a really, really intense job. You know, when, when things are tough, there's a lot of eyes on you and it's, it's, it's pretty intense. And then at the same time, you have the opportunity to do some incredible things and meet some, some pretty cool people along the way from all over the globe. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity to see farm shows in Germany and Brazil and Australia and New Zealand and Canada. And, and you know, a, a kid from central Iowa shouldn't have all those cool opportunities, but it's been a, quite a blessing over the last 30 years to be able to experience all these things and, and you know, be part of a lot of, uh, you know, pretty cool events happening. It, it's, you know, when you're in it and you're, you're behind the scenes working with a customer, making a big product introduction, I can think back to a few pretty important products that have been introduced at the Farm Progress show where you're you're sneaking them in in the middle of the night under the cover of darkness and then that big unveil happens at eight o'clock on Tuesday. So those are those are pretty cool to be a part of. Gosh, I feel like you could have stories that would take like two and a half hours. So maybe we'll have to catch up with you at the uh, beer tent at Husker this year. We'll have to ask for some more. Yeah. But- we already talked about the food stands at the show, a few of them, but a big part of these farm shows is just giving back to the local communities, such as the nonprofits that come in and run the food stands and in many other ways, you know, working on sustainability and giving back to the communities. What are some other examples of that? Well, you're, you're right. You know, we talked about the pork place, some call it the pork palace, but that's run by Sutton Christian schools. And we have a new one this year at Husker Harvest Days with Centura taking over one of the food stands, bringing in Cactus Jacks. But when you're at Husker Harvest Days, no matter what you're eating, it is brought to you by some school, whether it's a booster club or just the community school, you know, Wood River is there and, and, and several of them. But all the food served at Husker Harvest Days is done by local schools. And that's an opportunity for us to give back to the community because, and, you know, we work for Informa, which is a big trade show company, but we're putting it, we're putting together giant trade shows in places that aren't built to handle giant trade shows, right? There, there is not the infrastructure and staff levels and vendors that we would have if we were doing this in Vegas or Orlando or in Anaheim. So to put together a trade show of this magnitude in these rural areas you can't do it without these volunteer groups. I mean, they are the people, they are on the front lines. They are working the info booths and parking the cars and flipping the burgers and taking admission and driving the shuttles and trams. And, you know, they, I don't get to greet every visitor that comes to the show and you guys don't either. They are the ones that are greeting them and welcoming them to the community. And so it's a, it's a great partnership and we couldn't do it without them. And so we like in any way we can to give back to those community, you know, those, those volunteer groups 
Same thing at Farm Progress Show. You know, there are there are the the Kiwanis there in Boone. Gabe and his team are going to handle the info booths and they're going to greet all of our visitors and do a fantastic job. I have no doubt because they do a fantastic job of it every year. We obviously make a donation. I think uh, the last time I checked it, it's pushing $100,000 that we pump back into the community with donations um, just to get the work done to do the job. And that doesn't count food service and a number of other things. And then you couple that with some of the other sustainability things we do. You know, we get scored on our sustainability. Uh, our, our ability to be a sustainable event. And there's a lot of things that we've just always done that are just part of what we do, that we get great gold stars because we do them. Well, we just do them because it's the right thing to do, whether it's the health screening tent or it's giving back to these nonprofit organizations or, you know, in Nebraska, we have the, the, the largest food donation, you know, the, the largest food drive in central Nebraska occurs during Husker harvest days. And, and so a lot of these things that we just do because it's the right thing to do when you're doing a farm show in the Midwest, uh, they get us really good points in London uh, when we, when we get scored on sustainability, which is, which is, which is pretty great. And, you know, um, just it's, it's so very unique compared to anything else going on in the trade show industry to have these giant 4 million square foot exhibit spaces built in what a lot of folks would consider the middle of nowhere. I think Grand Island and Boone and Decatur are wonderful places to be, but some folks think they're middle of nowhere. Yeah, and and giving back to the community is such an important part of both of these shows and they have a great impact um, on the communities where they're held. And I know that like that food drive at Grand Island is just gigantic. All the FFA kids bring in, you know, their non-perishable food items and, you know, they get a sense of giving too. So it, it gives them an opportunity to do that. So that's really important as well. Um, Matt, we focused, you know, a lot on Farm Progress Show and Husker Harvest Days, but we want to remind our listeners that uh, they can find the show apps uh, for their smartphones in the episode description here, uh, where they can coordinate the sessions, uh, find a full map of the show grounds for both shows and, and more, and uh, can help them have a greater farm show experience. Now, outside of the shows we've covered already, yes. we know that there's another farm show under the Farm Progress umbrella, and it's the Organic Grower Summit, something new for us at Farm Progress, held in California this fall. Can you tell us a little bit, just a little bit more about that? Yeah, that really gets outside of our comfort zone, right? I mean, those of us that are, that are in the Midwest here covering crops and, and cattle and, and that kind of thing, uh, row crops and cattle, but uh, yeah, that was an acquisition that part coupled with another show that ended up going to another division within Informa. It was a it was two shows that, that we bought. Um, the Farm Progress Group ended up with the Organic Grower Summit because that's what we do. We do trade shows where service providers and equipment companies are the exhibitors and farmers are the attendees. Well, that's what or that's what OGS is. The Organic Grower Summit is is equipment and service providers for agriculture, but the growers that are coming are growing organic crops. And um, it, it's it's really outside of our comfort zone, but really a great opportunity for growth and a great opportunity for us to kind of plant a flag out there in, what, in, in the West and have something to hang our hat on there to work from. Um, it has been very educational. I was just out in, in Monterey for the other show, the Organic Produce Summit. And learning and getting to know this organic and, and more than just organic, but the, the produce segment has been very educational. I mean, they live a completely different world. They're still growing crops and delivering them and they have a lot of the same pests and, and those kind of problems and, and things, challenges to face, but how they, how they attack them is totally different. And it's been a great learning experience. I mean, I got to, to, to witness a laser weeder in action in the field, just creeping along at about one mile per hour, zapping weeds. It was identifying weeds and zapping them and killing them right in front of me. It was just fascinating to, to see that happen. And, you know, here in Western Illinois, if I tried to grow a, an organic field of corn or beans, it would be a mess. But they're, they're beautiful fields. They do a great job and grow a beautiful crop. And it's a very business oriented uh, audience that is at that event. It, they, are, they are fulfilling a need 
and we are just kind of the conduit try to try to get try to help them out meet new solution providers and that kind of thing so um, that show is this year it's the first week of december and it's held at, at the monterey hyatt it's a beautiful event beautiful venue it's you know the weather's almost always beautiful in monterey it's it's a beautiful place to come visit and if you like golf or you like the ocean and seafood either one of those things it's a big deal there we we got to see pebble beach and a couple of different other landmarks that i didn't ever think i'd have a chance to see so uh, it's a it's a cool event to add to our portfolio and a great opportunity for growth for us going forward yeah, well, you know, be fun to catch up with you after OGS this year, maybe, and kind of debrief on the show and and uh, some more things that that you learned uh, from this year's event. Well, Matt, um, you know, we could talk all day, um, but uh, we sure appreciate you stopping with us today and visiting. Um, we plan on seeing a lot more of you in the coming weeks as the farm show season really kicks up, and uh, we sure appreciate you taking time from your very busy schedule uh, to visit with us today. It's great to be with you guys. Thank you very, very much. I will look forward to doing this again sometime. Well, thanks again, Matt. Well, that's it for this version of FP Next, powered by John Deere. To our listeners, we want to thank you for listening in to this episode of FP Next, allowing us into your tractor cab, your truck, on your farm, and in your fields. A special thank you goes out to our digital production and marketing team members who put in a lot of work with us. And we want to remind our listeners once again about the Farm Progress Show this year in Boone, Iowa, on August 27th through the 29th, and Husker Harvest Day is set for Grand Island, Nebraska, on September 10th through the 12th. And if you want to be sure not to miss any top stories or farm show news, sign up for our Farm Progress Text Blasts, which bring the hot stories right to your inbox. You can sign up for those text alerts by texting FARM, F-A-R-M, to 20505. Be sure to follow Farm Progress on social media to stay up to date with ag news and more. And check out the digital edition of your regional publication at farmprogress.com. Find the links we talked about for the Farm Progress Show and Husker Harvest Days in the episode description and tune into our next episode of FP Next, where we will talk about top tricks and tips for whichever farm show you attend this year. Yep, that's a great topic. Pretty timely, too. So we look forward to that. Yeah. Follow along with FP Next by listening and subscribing on your favorite podcast platform or YouTube for the video edition or at Farm Progress Online. And be sure to leave us a review if you enjoy the show. Sarah says five stars or nothing. Definitely. And remember, if it's agriculture, your friends at Farm Progress have you covered. Here's wishing you high yields and good weather. We'll see you next time.